I want to welcome you here on our Advent pilgrimage of peace to Nazareth. We have made our way up from the Sea of Galilee here to this part where Jesus would have walked many times. We're in a cave, very clearly, but this is the neighborhood of Mary, whose house was just over here. Joseph, whose house was just up the hill in this tiny town of less than 500 people. It says later in the gospel, one of the questions is something good can come from Nazareth? We know the answer to that and we are here because in this place, in this very spot, the world changed. And this is what we're preparing for as we make our way toward Christmas. Now this cave is very important because as we know, there's caves like this all over the Holy Land, not just here in Galilee. This would be the innermost part of a house where people would keep their animals to keep things warm in the winter. They would store their food. You can see there's a cistern area here that just means a deep hole in the ground where you can keep food or, or liquids and things that you would need. But the outer part of the house is this uh, porch area that you see here, covered with a construction of wood and reeds and things to allow people to work, allow people to sleep, allow people to eat, etc. So the homes were larger, but this was the innermost part, and that's what we still have today. And we're going to be able to see what Mary's look like. But because this was her neighbor, she probably came here. She may have cooked here. Jesus may have come and played here with his neighbor's uh, children as well, Mary's neighbor's children, because he lived right up the street. He grew up here. What a blessing to begin in this place. So what does this have to do with the pilgrimage of peace? Besides the fact that we want to pray for peace in the Holy Land. Well, every week, just like I invite you to do right now, please have uh, your family sit around the Advent wreath. Light that first candle together. You can take out the Advent calendar that you have if you register for our pilgrimage. You can also have right next to you the prayer for peace in troubled times, which is something that I invite you to pray every single day. So was this a place of peace? Was Nazareth a place of peace? In a certain sense, probably more so than Rome, the center of the empire, because this was a place that was so tight, it was so poor, so quiet and tiny. There was a lot of hard work being done. But here, just like in other places in the Holy Land, they were conquered by the Romans. And so therefore, every, every person here and all over the Holy Land were praying for freedom, for liberation, and for peace. Now, I want to just give a context here because we know that the Romans came and they were the empire here. And it was in 63 BC that Pompey, the great uh, Roman general, conquered all of Palestine. And so he put the people here, the ancient Israelites, under foreign occupation. Now, this is the four, it's interesting to note that that would be the fourth foreign occupation or control over the people since the Babylonian exile 600 years before, before Christ. And if you look at the prophet Daniel, they equate this to the four beasts. And this fourth beast, however, you know, of, of, you know, of just like violence and all of this, this fourth beast, it says, was the worst oppressor for the Jewish people. But it also brought hope because it says there in the, in the prophet Daniel that the fourth, fourth beast marked the last pagan tyranny before the long-awaited Messiah vindicated God's people. So this was a time of expectation, and it was a time of hope. Now, I also want to draw another uh, parallel or just put this into context even further because after Pompey came the great Julius Caesar. And remember, he wanted to end the Republic. He was um, stopped by his friend Brutus, if you uh, remember your history. But then after that, his son, his adopted son Octavian, which was later called Augustus, he rises to power and then he takes total control of not the Republic, but the empire. And so that's interesting because you can even go to Rome today and see an altar to the Pax Romana, the peace that has come. It's the age of Roman prosperity and peace. Yet here there was violence and oppression. oppression. So you can see this contrast. But why do we call Caesar Augustus the Caesar of peace? Well, it's interesting. The Senate eventually had to accept something that, that Caesar Augustus said, and that is to make his father, his adopted father, Julius Caesar, a god. 
And if Julius Caesar was a god, who was Augustus, if not the son of God? And so what happened after that, they began erecting temples to the Caesars to pray to them. There was a great cult and this type of worship consolidated the power of Rome. And it's interesting, even the birthday of Caesar Augustus was celebrated, celebrated as good news to the world. Let's not forget that the world good or the word good news is evangelion. That's where gospel comes from. Evangelium, okay? Gospel, the good news. That was the good news of Caesar Augustus, the great Caesar of peace. He was the bringer of peace. In fact, the words they used was the savior of the world. And he ended a terrible political volatility in Rome, of course. That's why they called this the good news. So the world was ruled by Caesar who gave hope to humanity and was apparently the source of all good and unity. So let's look at what's happening here. He brought peace by violent imposition of Roman power. The brutal imposition of crucifixion, we know, is how Jesus died. So what's happening here in this quiet place? It's not an external peace. It's an internal one. So now I want to invite you to come into the place, into the church right in front of me, where we see Mary's ancient home. And let's see where this inner peace, the true peace that changes the world, comes from. Now we've come down from those external caves where we just were. As we said, that's Mary's neighbor. And this cave right behind us, this grotto, was Mary's house. You can see the cave looks a little taller than the rest of them. It's because over the years people have visited time and again to experience heaven coming to earth in the same place where it says right here under the altar there's a circle with the words H-I-C, here. Here the angel came and spoke with Mary. Here she said yes and here the word became flesh. You can see the stairs behind me to my left, and that's where pilgrims would come in. They would come out here. But why would they choose this cave and not the one right next door? Well, the main reason is because the first Judeo-Christians, in other words, the people who first followed the Lord, of course they were Jewish. And where would they come and pray? Where would they come and meet? That's what they would use synagogues for. And so when they did the excavations here, they found a synagogue. But they also found an, an engraving in different parts of you know, places. People leave graffiti even today. And that graffiti was in Greek, the language they all spoke back then. And it said, Hail Mary, Hail Mary. Here, not up top, and even, not even further up. And so with the synagogue, the engraving, and then a Byzantine church, we have some beautiful mosaics that they found. When is the Byzantine era? It's when the Christians could first start to practice their faith. And very importantly, they found a baptismal font right here. That's where people became part of the Christian faith. So important to say this was an important part for the first Christians, an important place for the first Christians, where people came and prayed and still come and pray even today. And that's why we are here to pray for peace. The other image I love here, looking at the cave, you know, the innermost part of what would have been Mary's house, is it's got, you know, a space on the inside. It's ready to receive something. And so when she's praying, she's not only raising her mind and heart to the Lord, like so many people at this time praying for peace, but she was open to him. She was open to receive his grace. And I think that's one of the most important invitations we can accept during this Advent pilgrimage of peace. Let's open up a space for the Lord to work inside. Because as we said, there's a lot of external things happening. There's a lot of violence, even like there was back then. But when the Prince of Peace came, as we read in Isaiah in our introductory talk, he came inside of her, right in this place. There were zealots at this time, just like you know, trying to fight the Romans off in a violent way. But what is it that changed the world? The silent prayer and space where the Lord could come in. Now, when we talk about the biblical concept of peace, we go to the word, as we said, shalom in the Old Testament, which is irene or irene, the Greek word in the New Testament. The two meet right here, 
where the old is fulfilled in the new and the new is enlightened by the old. Well, what does the shalom actually mean? We talked about it a little bit, but one of the main things is like a stone, a stone without cracks and a whole shape because shalom means complete or whole. If you look at the altar here, it's a complete stone. It's an altar stone, a shalom stone. If you look at the bricks here that protect this cave from falling because it's been here and venerated for so long, it makes it in one piece so it doesn't fall down. It's not broken. It's shalom. It's peace. And that's actually something that Joshua says in the Old Testament. But when you complete something with a lot of pieces, something that's missing, something that needs to become complete and made whole, that's what was happening at the time that Mary was here. She was paying, praying for shalom. It's just like Job, um, one of the things it says in the Old Testament, he knew that his tents were shalom because he was missing nothing. What was the world missing at this point? Peace. The Prince of Peace, who has come to make everything whole. So in this place, the angel Gabriel came. Now, I just want to remind us, Gabriel and all of the hosts of heaven, when we talk about hosts, it means the great army, the great soldiers. That means war. But these are warriors of peace. He came, and what he said was, Hail Mary. Hail Mary. He, as the general, is saluting the one who, as he says, is full of grace. And he probably came down as we see on his knees, as we see in so many artistic renditions of what happened here in the Annunciation. Hail, queen of peace, queen of angels. But why? What is the difference between her and everyone else? This space, which then he says, is full of grace. The Lord is with you. The Lord's life came rushing into that space. It's like a vacuum. And it is filled with the Prince of Peace. It is filled with the Lord who became flesh. This is what makes this space so important. When we talk about peace and our prayer for peace, as you can look at the litanies that I invite you all to pray every week during our virtual pilgrimage of peace, it's an internal thing. It's an internal value. It's the Lord who comes inside of us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. C.S. Lewis actually writes, if we had the eyes of Gabriel, if we had the true eyes of God, when we would see each person in front of us that is filled with the Lord's life, children of God, like ones who are baptized, we would fall down just like the angel Gabriel did. We would salute them and say, hail full of grace, the Lord is with you. We would be stunned and moved by their beauty. And suddenly the peace would come in us. Joy would enter in. We know what happens with Mary. The angel says, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Jesus, we say in the Hail Mary. And as soon as the angel, as Gabriel explains what's happening with her cousin Elizabeth, when she's explaining what's going on, how can I say yes, I'm, I'm your, the servant of the Lord, be it done unto me according to your word. She takes her things and she runs off to the hill country of Judea to visit her cousin Elizabeth. What does that say about peace? When the Lord's life fills us up like this cave, like this internal space within Mary's heart is filled, it not only brings us peace, we become agents of peace, apostles of peace, and the world is changed. We'll see next week what happens when she sees Elizabeth. We'll see what the angel Gabriel is doing, not just coming here to Mary. So from this beautiful cave, from this place, we have prayed the Angelus for each and every one of you. That's repeating the prayer the salutation that Gabriel made to, to Mary as we begin this Advent season. And our prayer is that the Lord's life fill each and every one of us, each and every one of you. And we hope you continue following uh, the footsteps of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus on this Advent pilgrimage of peace and praying for peace. And may God bless you. Quella che portato.